studio. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I never know exactly what we're going to talk about, um, but I'm interested. So, um, so first of all, how are you? What's going on? I'm good. I'm I'm feeling a little bit of trepidation though with okay. this, with this right. topic uh, okay. a little bit because right. now, let me get the, a close up of you in being. With that being being here. fearful, <laughs> uh, feeling a little bit of fear. Well, it's no. Not, I, I think we're all fine. So uh, tell me about it, though. I want to understand. Well, so we talked about it, maybe a couple of subjects. This this kind of reminds me of the uh, infamous episode where we did the leadership practices of the Grateful Dead. Came yeah. in with an article, didn't have any questions, right. and just uh, riffed off that. So we're we're riffing off the whole idea of millennials. I, you know, I, I like riffing just to make a statement about yeah. that because I think it, it, we freeform some things. Yeah. And uh, we're not spitting out something that's written and staged. And um, But that's exactly why I think you had a bit of trepidation there because we can go off in left field, and uh, at least I can, and not get back very, very quickly. So uh, being limited um, and, and that kind of thing. But... Um, yeah, I think today we're going to talk about millennials because millennials, listen, um, we hear the term. It's just like anything else. And we're going to talk a little bit later about uh, Pinker, I think, in some of his book, uh, from, from his new book, some things out of there. But uh, first, it just seems like that um, we have an impression of what millennials, there's a tag, there is a, a hashtag, there, <laughs> there is a... Uh, there's a term that's out there, and I think we quickly draw a conclusion about what that means, yeah. and we move on. And until we kind of move back into examining what these millennials are doing, what they're facing, what the environment is like at this point, um, I, I don't think we really know. So it's good that you want to talk about that. Well, there's kind of a conventional wisdom, right? That, sure. That there is, first, there is a millennial person right and I, and they're all and, and, and it's a group it's a group and they're yeah. all exactly the same yeah yeah they, <laughs> they have they have these commonalities and I, I i remember this first became a a sort of hot topic when we were college professors right right and uh, right. We're, we're going to get the millennials well, the millennials yes. are coming yes and, and we had to prepare for them in a certain way we had to look at the content we're trying to teach and make sure that they're at a level they can understand. We can communicate with them. We challenge them and then get to know a little bit more about what it's all about to be a millennial. Well, they're all tech savvy. That was the first thing. Oh, they're, they, coming they, 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 they're coming in with tech and you don't have tech. You're a, what? what is it? You're a digital immigrant. They're digital natives. Digital natives. So I love what it. I found when I brought the tech to class, the <laughs> <laughs> they were like, uh, well, yeah, I use it for Facebook and, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But the idea that you could, uh, that you could utilize technology in class to stimulate up to the moment discussion, facts, that kind of thing. I, I th first of all, I think that that's keen that you kind of, uh, talked about that i also realized that they were using technology in the class between each other so they were communicating in the class yep that's right uh, not talking verbally so that you would sort of see that happen as much as they were on their instruments flying back and forth right. and so there was another conversation going on in the classroom yeah. that you were not necessarily privy to yeah i my uh, graduate assistant hit me to that i mean i i i uh mentioned the next day after a class where i said you know uh i i think it's good that we have technology and all and that folks can look things up and it doesn't really bother me right and and she said well you know what they're doing and i said no she said well they're texting each other and i said oh okay and she said but they're texting about what we're discussing in class so there's an ongoing 
constant discussion going on. Right. Because so, the fear would be that they're saying, hey, uh, this professor is not all that great. Let me uh, register. Let me go on to rate my professor and give him a one star or yeah, something. Yeah, it, that, that, that it could have been that or it could have been I'm going to so have a margarita after class or right. I'm going to simply Greek to eat. That's yeah, it. <laughs> I mean, it could have been anything, but – According to my graduate assistant at that time, it was it was sort of a an ongoing conversation, which I thought, yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. I, I think I, I didn't mean to uh, frame it too negatively there, because I think those guys, the especially the ones I had in my class, were graduate and yours as well. Yeah, they were graduate students, so they were dedicated. They wanted to learn. They were ready for that. So. Um, but it's that little nagging thought uh, uh, about, OK, I'm not privy to that. Uh, communication. I think we should all be communicating in that. In that, so. So uh, you you have this whole idea of millennials are now in the workforce. Some of them are approaching, I guess, thirty. So they've been in the workforce a while. I know uh, one of my colleagues uh, was talking about the uh, the next group, the post millennials or homelanders. Some people call them. It's a whole different group, uh, a whole different generation that's now hitting the universities. Is, freshmen sophomores that kind of thing so 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 time marches on right right and i and I, i'm just aware that um you know we did a little research we, we're going to pull up some websites here to take a look at and there's yeah. one that makes a list of you know the top 10 issues the top facing. 10 issues yeah. we're going to give a uh, shout out to these guys here in just a moment but yeah the, best work best work dot com uh, yeah. best work, mm-hmm. uh, dot com we we want to appreciate uh they're uh, helping us with uh, our discussion today. And so they've listed 10, and let yeah. me read this first one to you and let you okay. react. Okay, okay, here we go. Um, millennials are the brainiest, best educated generation ever, according to a special report compiled by The Economist. Okay. Wow. Um, what just happened? Weren't we uh, well educated too, Tom? I don't know. Uh, how you feel about that? But these guys got it on us quite a bit. Well, you know, I, and my question, I guess, to that would be what what constitutes that best education? What, you, you know, see, sometimes when you drill down, uh, is it the best education in terms of the traditional Western canon of literature? Uh, we learn some math. We learn some science. Uh, B, what about... Uh, uh, different kinds of practices that you may need to work in the new millennial? Uh, are they learning about that? What what constitutes the the, the best education ever? Well, I think you, you got a big point there. And um, oh, best, I mean, how, how do you define yeah, that? There's yeah. the, it's an impossible task for, for most of us. I think they were saying that 61% uh, of adult millennials have attended college oh, okay. compared to 46% of baby boomers right so um here we go throwing baby boomers under the bus again but uh, right. there's more opportunity for education now i want to jump ahead and say that part of this problem they're facing is the way they had to pay for that education right because yeah. i think they're coming out with all of this debt right and we're hearing about that in the news and it's a big deal in the political campaigns and all of those things cost too. of college has gone up Uh, And uh, and it's gone up. One reason is because of what people expect out of the college experience. So and that's not often discussed. I mean, the one of the things is that, well, the cost of college has gone up and it's uh, everyone's having to take out these loans. But but college is very competitive so in order to attract students, you uh, as a college I guess had to look at what what other people were doing and match that so you were competitive and some of those things were costly you know yes. so it, it did drive up the cost and then uh, you know uh, uh, facilities and uh, perks for students and if it's a residential facility do you have a, do you have a climbing wall do you have a plenty yeah, of swimming that, that, facilities that was part of it. the universities had to get um, right. Uh, lazy rivers and uh, yeah, that other was the big thing. The lazy <laughs> river got to be a, but there there were so many of those kinds of things, and also the uh, the kinds of things like first year experiences and all the support for students on campus that 
when you and I attended, we attended the same college at the same time, and the support for, for students at that time right. was largely go to the gym. Luck, you may be lucky, and you may have a card number that enables you to actually get some courses you need. That was yes. That was, I remember really my first year experience. Now first year experience is a it's a huge thing yes. for uh, the millennials, post millennials. But uh, yeah, baby boomers. When we went through, uh, you know, uh, co- college didn't cost it anywhere near as much. But I can remember sitting outside the gym at three o'clock in the afternoon, having been there since eight, and I had a salmon colored card. And when I got in there, there were, there were no freshman courses available to take except a couple of PEs. I remember I got flicker ball. Okay, and I, there you we know, go. So uh, that was a sport. I got a, a sport. chip and putt course at one point about okay. golf. So, yeah, that's how so, it works. So it was a different time. And yeah, it, 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 it really was. And I think um, part of what you're saying is that, that universities have to be attractive to the upcoming students yeah. to, to get them in and keep the population uh enrollment up of course and that that they focused on that so they've changed the environment and you know the libraries now the the kiosks the groupings right the right. uh, uh, coffee shops in the library those kind of things are a regular feature on on the college campus and that's to keep people involved but you talked about the freshman experience yeah um, I'm not sure there was a freshman experience when we, you and I were coming up. Well, there day. was one, but it was it was you just experienced what went on, <laughs> and uh, and and uh, we were. I was sort of a non traditional student, and you, you you were too in a way. You came back after having been on a on the road with a with a rock band and playing all over the United States, and then you decided to come back to college. I came back to college after. I, I went as a uh, freshman and then dropped out and spent a few years doing different things, doing some uh, different kinds of work and that kind of thing, which I think was all good for me. Right. But when I returned, then I worked full time and attended college uh, in the daytime. I worked full time at night. So, uh, you, you know, the, there was no real... Right. Uh, rah rah college experience for me it was i i if i made class at nine good right because i was up till uh one o'clock in the morning working the night before right right you know, and, and that, that was my freshman year my first year experience wow okay well i mind similar and the the idea that uh work was a big part of getting through school uh as well so the universities have done their research uh, that's why we have these climbing walls and, and so forth to attract students in, yep. uh, as well as uh, tuitions going up. And now we're getting to the point um, where millennials have uh, accumulated a lot of debt. Um, they're looking for jobs, but they may be underemployed. So let's take a look at this uh, survey again where it says um, – that uh, the U.S. Census data shows that 40% of our nation's unemployed are millennials. Yeah. Uh, what's up with that? What's the first reaction you have to this 40% being? So what is un- underemployed? What does that mean? Because with with my college degree, the first thing I, w- I did was I went out and I worked for a convenience store. And then the second thing I did was run a cigarette route in Atlanta and work at a restaurant at night. So when I was first married, I had a college degree, but I was working nights in a restaurant and days as a vendor. I And that was just, that's what we did until you sort of found yourself and found what you were going to ultimately do. Well, uh, the unemployment, that's just a research an- analyst that, that uh, looked at those statistics. And I'm thinking that... Um, you know, is there a lack of jobs out there? We hear the labor uh, statistics coming out in the news. Um, what is it that is um, really behind this unemployment for millennials? I think we can talk some more. Maybe we'll come up with an idea or two about well, that. Well, could it be a philo- philosophical thing for universities? I mean, universities have typically aimed at a at a at an education that has a 
a breadth and depth. And then technical colleges have aimed at an education that essentially prepared you for a gig. Right. So uh, I and know that, that's why um, they sort of targeted where the, the liberal college education was just kind of helping you understand the world and becoming a critical thinker and right. and uh, be prepared for whatever that job is. And now it seems like jobs are very specific, particularly technology jobs and other types of jobs that are out there. So I'm yeah, kind of curious. But I guess my my question is where where do we where do we actually lock in on the majority of young people as to finding a career path, for instance? Uh, for me, it really ended up uh, late in my twenties, and of course that was a different time. But if we're if we we are expecting every uh, college graduate to come out and at twenty two, twenty three years old find their career and hit at a at a uh, huge salary, uh, at whatever they perceive as a huge salary. Incidentally, we were talking about Steven Pinker. Right. He would say, uh, right now we live in the wealthiest economy there that's ever existed on the face of the planet. And it's not just here, it's globally. So there are some thinkers that say conventional wisdom says unemployed, uh, underemployed Whereas if you really look at standard, true standard of living, even for uh, uh, folks who at another time may have been in poverty, the actual standard of living, health, their health, their longevity expectations, uh, their entertainment, their potential for entertainment, that, that those things are so astronomically better than say they were when you and I uh, graduated oh, from college oh, in the 70s. Oh, absolutely. Now, that would I mean, be Pinker's view. Yeah. Well, I think that's a pretty valid v- view as well. I mean, everybody's got an $800 uh, cell phone, and they're always connected. There's got entertainment on demand. Right, I mean, right. uh, education on demand, too, as, as well. And just exposure and the communication, which we talked about last time, uh, the idea that uh, – the communication age, the information age, it's all kind of uh, uh, come together at this point so that um, it does seem like Pinker's on the right track when you look at how wealthy we really are. And, then, of course, the, the issue is you can take that for granted, but um, comparatively, you're absolutely right. Um and I think he's right in that. So, well, anyway, his 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 writing is provocative. And in, in, in reading the book and discussing it with uh, friends, I, I always issue the caveat: I don't agree with everything he says. Right, of course. But at the same time, uh, you, you know, going back to underemployed, my first question would be: Is that really true? Is what does underemployed mean? It means you're not pulling down six figures or the the high fives in your twenties. Well, right, right. I, I, I mean, uh, in, you can't be the CEO when you come out of college. Don't well, you have to work in the mailroom and get yourself uh, kind of up to speed uh, uh, with that? Maybe not. Maybe there's a different impression that if I'm uh, a millennial and I've got all of these uh, advantages, maybe I should go up the ladder quicker. I can I can uh, illustrate with an anecdote. I, I, right. I, there's a millennial couple I'm familiar with okay. uh, that uh, they, uh, they're both employed. Uh, neither of them probably has the end game career employment. Uh, at the same time, they both own their cars. They have a, what I think of is a uh, domicile. They don't own a house, but they're talking about buying one. Okay. They're living in an apartment. Okay. Uh, the apartment's very nice. It's okay. a gated community. It, it, all the, and then things I wouldn't have thought of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, they, didn't, they didn't get cable TV, for instance. Okay. Uh, because it's just sort of boring. They'd rather have Netflix where they have whatever the at their choice uh, and so uh, forth uh, cutting uh, the cable yes yeah yeah so uh yeah are some things are some things still out there where where they could become more affluent in in relation to where they are now oh absolutely but when i compare where i was 
at that age as a young married guy with two children. There's just no comparison as to what's available for them and what's available, what was available for me. I oh, mean, nice. I can Easy. I can sure remember uh, going to my dad when uh, we'd had a tough month and saying, hey, I need you to float me a little something so I can take the kid to the doctor. Luckily, I had that, uh, that ability. Yeah. So, I, again, my question is, what, what are the expectations? Are the expectations that... Uh, uh, you know, we had some roaring times during the Clinton era, and people would come out of college and and make the the high fives and the and the low six figure incomes. Yeah, was it everybody? I, mm-hmm. I think we you'd have to take a look at that. Anyway, let's take a look at this um, this next uh, idea here that the uh, Americans between eighteen and thirty four are earning less today than the same group did in the past. So um, this says something about you. Yes, you have more resources now. You had less then, Mm -hmm. but they're not making as much money coming out of college in this uh, in this day and age. So um, and I'd heard this before that that your children may not make as much money. And the, the, uh, the American dream was always. Uh, the next generation will do better than the last and will keep kind of progressing in that way. So there's some challenges to that now. Well, see, and again, I, I, I uh, wonder if perhaps, perhaps it, when you look at the comparison of uh, purchase power of uh, dollars today and the purchase power of dollars uh, when we're making the comparisons, uh, if, if that uh, if that's accurate, uh, my question would be, uh, could you go on Amazon and find uh, clothes at a uh, 40% discount or uh, uh, buy a reasonable car for uh, under $20,000, you know? I, I mean, I understand that the uh, when you compare dollars to dollars in inflation, in the inflationary terms, maybe that is true. But if that is true, why do so many have so much? Uh, I, I mean, you know, I don't, since I don't have the figures in front of me, I... I uh, no, but I mean, that, that's a very good, good point. But let, let, me, let me add this. Um, it seems like, and you know, Dan uh, Rose and I uh, talk about stress and mental illness, mental yeah. health, those kind of issues. Uh, and it seems like this millennial generation is uh, having to deal with more stress, depression, other kinds of things. Here's what they. Uh, here's what's said on the uh, uh, on this uh, list of millennial problems. Millennials are reporting the highest levels of stress and depression than any other generation at the same age. Okay. Uh, so what do you, where is it, yeah, I and, mean, what, what comes with more opportunity and advances, some other things come with it too. Or like is it, is the operative word reporting? Okay. Because if you expected the, uh, the George H.W. Bush generation that endured the depression, the Great Depression and World War II, if you expected them to talk about how depressed they were, Un, with the stresses of the Cold War, the likelihood would be that they wouldn't have discussed it. I, I think of um, my right. my father and his colleagues from the military, uh, you know, at that era, and they and my father uh, j- returning from Vietnam. Right. Th- there would never be any discussion of it was stressful. It was scary. I'm depressed. I got PT. I, I mean, that. I, <laughs> no, I, and I, I hear I think, where you're coming from. Just the reporting of it. I, I'm, I'm not sure those things weren't there. Right. And I'm not sure that uh, they didn't present in other ways. For instance, uh, acting in ways that you, you, you know, uh, the, the the conventional wisdom was, well. Dad went, oh, you know, he went to war, and then he came back. He's a different guy. He just wasn't the same guy. Right. Well, and uh, and I and I can sure tell you, you when you woke my dad up, you woke him up standing in the doorway. You didn't go tap him in bed. Right. Because 
he had he presented all <laughs> kinds of uh, combat savvy skills that you didn't want to be the victim of, right? right? As Absolutely. when he came out of a deep sleep for your safety. But uh, now, kind of now, growing up, and I knew a lot of uh, uh, career army uh, personnel who had been in several of uh, combat theater, some of them were really, really bad. Vietnam, uh, sure. Korea was oh, right. uh, really bad. Of course. And so the question is, are we more willing, in a good way, to talk right. about these things? So is it is that an apt comparison? I don't know. No. And again, I mean, it, I'm, it, just, I'm just throwing these things out for thought. It could very well be, yeah, hey, they're just more stressed out and it's more stressful and uh, gosh, we've got a whole whole generation of stressed out folks. Well, I think I think what you did was bring up a good point about that, and whether it was really reported um, at and in in the way with all of this these changes in technology and communication issues that we're talking about. So it's more out on the table. But one thing that I know about stress for these millennials is that they're under a huge debt. So if well, you that, look at yeah. the yeah, excuse me, if you look at the debt, the Americans owe more than one point three trillion dollars in student loans at the end of June when they calculated those numbers. So I don't know about you, but I don't like debt that much, uh, even though yeah. I have it. And uh, my job is to get rid of that debt as best I can. But it is a stressor when you wake up and say, how am I going to pay these bills? How am I going to uh, get this credit card down? How am I going to do these things? But now you just paid um, forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars or more, and here are some of those cases, and to, for tuition and, and for college. So they take out these loans, now they've got to pay them back. Yeah. And, and the cost of college is in, in comparatively with uh, you know, earlier times, is, is just it's just an unbelievable level of growth i mean it, it's exponential it's beyond uh beyond uh just being uh you know twice as much or or that kind of thing yeah it, it seems like everything's more complicated and i don't that's a blanket statement and i'll probably um regret saying that in that way but the notion is that i'm not sure i want to be that millennial or that up-and-coming kid um and with the world as it is now and the sort of the we talked about chaos and all the other kind of things uh in the world but you know back to pinker he's saying if there was one of his first books the better angels of a nature saying there's less violence well and and so when you talk about we're richer than ever then um yeah a lot of things come come along with that so the the stress then the debt and then the figuring out the strategies to pay for it and still have a life and still have those things that you that you wish you had well and and when you talk about debt the u.s is in debt so what what happens we're running such a huge uh debt to future generations oh yeah that's a big issue so yeah so that that's another issue yeah well i think a uh, part of that um is that uh Well, we, there, there are just a lot of challenges out there, but you're talking about in the context, in the, you know, in our society, culture here, that we're facing that on one level uh, for the future, our kids, our grandkids, and their kids, and so forth. Yeah. But at the same time, it's happening now for individuals and families. Right. So there's a there's a lot of stuff going on. Let's go down our list a little bit more on this. It says millennials experience greater difficulty in securing a job that utilizes their degree yeah. than those of a similar age a decade ago. Yeah. What do you make of that? I I, I mean I, I can't argue with that at all. And in fact I really can't argue with any of the, the points made by uh best work. I, I think uh that they're they're facts and their their research is is uh, are both very sound it's the the uh, whole idea that uh, when you get a college degree and then you graduate and then you can't find work in that field I think that's that's apt mm -hmm. and uh, you know there's plenty of stories about uh, uh, students graduating and then having to go back to school and getting additional graduate school or, or getting some other kind of certification, that kind of thing. Right, 
Right. So, so the what the the couple of the big issues that we've come up with the idea of uh, student debt, which is clearly it's a it's a big issue, and the idea of underemployability. Well, if your debt's that high, then your expectations of income would be equally high, right? Right. And then the third thing, you can't uh, find the kind of work that you felt like you trained to. So it sounds to me like like at least two of the things we've talked about relate directly to what universities do. In other mm-hmm. words, mm-hmm. Uh, what, what can we do public policy-wise to curtail debt? And uh, what can we do uh, at the university level to to start thinking about employability for students who graduate. And just to say we are going to teach some soft skills and teach some get-along skills and those kinds of things, I I think the corporate world has different – they expect that, but they also expect students who come in uh, ready or graduates who come in ready to do something to contribute to contribute to the bottom line in whatever the field is so there there could be a disconnect there right it seems like we're in this uh service economy but also the technology economy too and you end up in one of the others although uh, i'm thinking there's just a lot of misconceptions that i think some of the younger folks may have okay but i said it but that that uh they are going to move up up the chain very quickly and being the CEO, or they're going to find some uh, sophisticated job that pays a lot of money when, um, you know, had they focused on it while they were in school? Did they get training specific to that job area? So it's a challenge both for the individual coming in the university, but the universities themselves to make sure that they're they're giving a product out that's going to help the person move to that job. So you graduated with a four four year degree in psychology. I, did. I graduated with a four year college in Eng, a four year degree in English, right? Okay. And uh, when you uh, graduated from college, what was your what kind of work did you do then? Well, that's a all right. You're asking a question here. I have an answer for that. Let me tell you that um, I had applied for jobs, and I heard two things. One, you are um, underqualified for this job <laughs> right? Uh, to work uh, with counseling, with clients, and th- so forth in that way. But you're also overqualified for the other jobs that there was available. So I got both of those, and ultimately, the long story short, we moved to North Carolina and went to graduate school, went as to you graduate were talking school. about. Yeah, absolutely. And... Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's tough, but here's another issue. I, I skipped over this one. I don't know if that was a Freudian slip or not because this is a personal thing that's happening with me is that um, uh, problem number six on the list, it's becoming more common for millennials to live at home. Yeah. And, um, and true, later and later. True, yeah. by the way, mm-hmm. uh, in my case, a son who just graduated and he's at home, so... Um, yeah, I think I think it's tough, but you know, home ownership and finding an apartment, like the couple you talked about, I mean, yep. those kind of things yep. are um, that's a difficult thing to make happen. All the ducks have to line up in, right. a, in a row. Well, and, and then the home ownership thing may be out of the question if you've encumbered a huge college debt too. So yeah, so let me uh, with that in mind, let me just jump to this one. This is problem eight. Millennials are less likely to be homeowners than young adults in previous generations. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling because I think that's all. Uh, everyone has that, that idea. Not everyone, but, uh, you know, mm-hmm. most people have those ideas to, find, to have a home and so forth. And I'm looking around. We're in an area where there's a lot of building going on. There are homes and apartments, and people are trying to build uh, residences. So um, I'm wondering how all this lines up. Uh, somebody's buying those homes. Um, maybe it's an elder. Maybe it's the elder generation moving around. What well, the think? housing market's roaring, and and again, all I can do is go back to the baby boomer experience because I I think yeah maybe maybe we're comparing this generation with a generation that uh, came out of college during the. Uh, during the 90s when uh, the economy was roaring and the dot-com boom was happening and 
and then the bubble burst. And, and the other thing, too, is the millennials have graduated from college in arguably the, the largest economic downturn since the Depression. And maybe some of the issues that, that are the unanticipated consequences right. of the 2007 uh, economic downturn uh, we're still recovering from those, and some we may never recover from. It it may just take another generation to uh, to develop the new technologies that create the next huge economic boom. Yeah. Now, which which doesn't let uh, policymakers off the hook for for uh, some of the issues that that uh, graduates have now. With you know going back to the the whole idea of debt and maybe degrees that. Uh, at one time, the the degree was a it was a credential. It was currency. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've mm-hmm. you you've proven you're a finisher. So now you uh, somebody's going to take a take a risk on you. Whereas uh, today, maybe not so much. And so maybe that that's at the heart of several of these issues. Uh, yeah, you you may just have had more options for employment than you do now, or either it's more specific in in certain ways. So it turns out that um, th- there's a fragility to this. And let's look at this idea here, and we'll wrap this up with the last two ideas that millennials are financially fragile. And this is from a survey from the Washington Post that sixty three percent of millennials have difficulty covering an unexpected $500 right. expense, um, those kinds of things. And then finally, um, uh, fewer and fewer millennials are becoming entrepreneurs. Uh, I find that one um, kind of surprising in a way because I, I really see this movement toward people starting their own business, coming up with ideas, partnering with people, and starting new businesses, Um at least in my uh, now, I I may have to refer to Pinker again or dig into the facts, but the idea is is that's that's what I'm thinking uh, that that is occurring, more more people being entrepreneurs, but not so with the millennials. So maybe maybe again going back to uh, to policy and to education. Uh, is is it time in education and also time for policymakers to take a look at at where you know where do we want to go and then what kinds of things do we do to get there? I the, you know I something uh, someone said to me and and this was uh, and and I have a habit of going back. Well, when I graduated from college, we didn't have anything. I had to go back and. I uh, began a 25-year uh, love affair with graduate school. I, I was constantly <laughs> getting new degrees. And, you know, I, the list of them expanded depending on what I was doing at the time, right? But the, what was said to me was, well, just to survive today, you have mm-hmm. to have the cell phone. You have to have a car. You ha- the, the old idea that you could get an apartment – and rely on public transportation and go down to the payphone when you wanted to make a few phone. You you can't survive, and these things all have costs. And so the costs in those terms are so much higher. I don't really know what to make of that. I I uh, uh, I, I don't think we'd all want to go back and give up our smartphones and give up our our cars. But at the same time, uh, maybe maybe the time frame the culture we lived in was easier on us at at that age so if if that is in fact true then like a lot of uh uh problems and issue and uh challenges uh maybe it's time for a hard look at uh at how to how to get to where we want to be is uh full employment at a job that is rewarding and makes plenty of money for everybody. Is that a is that a goal in this economy? Well, then how do we get there? How, is having right. more entrepreneurs a goal? How do we get there? I, I know uh, previous uh, governments have mm-hmm. set uh, real uh, 
uh, goals and uh, uh, visions, and then we seem to find ways to attain those. So maybe that's where we are now. Well, it does seem like, um, I mean, what you, what you brought up for me is, is it, as you started with that, is the notion that it's uh, uh, cyclic. Uh, there's, there are these cycles that we go through, and uh, we can't always see what's on the horizon in terms of how we manage uh, the, the problems and difficulties that we have now. But Because I was thinking, um, we talked about this um, a while back, but the idea that there are more and more uh, apps and, and uh, exposure to meditation and mindfulness and mindfulness mm-hmm. apps that remind yeah. you to yeah. put your phone down. The phone actually pops up a message on my phone that says, now's a good time to put your phone down. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I find that there's a lot of that going on. In other words, we're trying to find that space, that quiet zone that, that, that is uh, a little away from the, the noisy crowd and the, all the expectations, all the things that are going on for us now, um, which I find is uh, probably helpful because we have been tethered to the phones and the information and we need to know everything that's going on right now what's happened in other countries around the world even that we find that on our phone immediately we didn't have that in the past so now we we're more informed but there has to be some way to sort of filter that and and to make it uh, healthy for us to be able to be informed and still have a a life a private life a, a a relaxed life as well as the hard charging side of what, what right. we're facing so. right well if if nothing else then if this is uh, this is sort of the lot of the millennial right now, mm-hmm. then uh, it really is uh, time for a real discussion on how to if first if it needs to be changed, how to change it, and that kind of thing. Because uh, according to Pinker, uh, geez, uh, the millennials are going to live a long time. I mean, just to see. Uh, where yeah, I just pulled up as you mentioned uh, Pinker here. This is his latest book, Enlightenment. Now I know you're reading it now. Yeah, the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. Um, so the in the uh, oh, by the way, Bill Gates, my new favorite book of all time. So okay, there's a quote. Everybody needs uh, you need that that quote too. Well, I think but. Pinker and Gates are besties. So uh, oh, okay, you know, that's uh, what it yeah, was. They he go to the same to, conferences. Okay, yeah. there there you go. Yeah. That explains it. Well, I, I think uh, one of the things that we're finding here, and his question in in the book, and and maybe you can kind of help help me understand a little more about it, is the world really falling apart? Uh, are we just inundated and overwhelmed by all of this? Uh, but he's sort of taking a, a different look. Now, he's a cognitive science and scientist and uh, intellectual that um, has written a number of books here, but um, w- he's, he's presenting information that uh, we don't often see in the news. You know, we see the chaos and the problems and the disasters, right. uh, but um, he's presenting a very different uh, view of where we're at. Maybe it's not so bad now. Well, I... I- I think first you you mentioned the news. I think that's uh, we we talked about that a little bit on our last conversation, the whole idea of communication and how in uh, the current mental health, I guess, landscape, uh, you you have access to so many things, but things we may not have thought of. Uh, Although, you know, we did think a good bit about Vietnam and the new and nuclear war. So we were worried about that. But uh, but. I, I think what what Pinker's point, I think it, ultimately where he's going with this book is that science has taken us from an era of untold violence, of constant worry about illness, short of expectation of longevity. Uh, the large majority of the world in abject poverty that i mean uh famine style poverty right and in really a i guess a hundred years that's been transformed by science that would be his point he mm-hmm. he says that beginning and he shows all these graphs that, right. that where right. 
where you see an exponential growth in longevity, for instance, uh, right? Or uh, and uh, uh, a uh, huge drop in in uh, fatal illnesses and that kind of thing. Sure. And I, I think what he, his point of view would be, and what he says is that if you have issues, then ultimately do like. Uh, the the Apollo team did throw everything on the table and figure out how do we address this issue with science, and that that has been a proven a proven uh, uh, improvement on a an exponential and evolutionary level for for humankind. At the same time, Pinker has a large number of detractors who say the exact opposite that say that virtually every issue we have, climate change, uh, uh, inequity, stress, every one of those can be related to poorly thought out (laughs) scientific innovations. So uh, far from being someone who would say that, uh, you know, I've, uh, the Pinker's got all the answers and, and that, uh, the uh that these issues don't exist i i still think that uh that somewhere in the middle is the is maybe where we should go you know we we talked about i think you're probably right about that we we talked about uh maybe doing a a a segment on leadership yes and something i I, i've noticed uh and i think in in the leadership realm now we, we we sort of have uh two approaches and one is uh sort of the autocratic approach where uh uh this is what we're going to do and i have the power so we're doing this Mm -hmm. and then there's also the sort of ideological approach where i subscribe to let's say i'm a follower of stephen pinker or i'm a follower of liberalism or or conservatism or whatever ism is uh a lot of isms out there yeah a lot of isms and in order, once you go down that road, you can't do the uh, Apollo approach, which is to throw everything you've got in the space capsule on the table and say, how do we get these guys home using just what we have on the table? You have to lose your ego. You have to lose your ideology. You have to you have to be willing to work with others and that kind of thing. And right. I think... Uh, Absolutely. Maybe some of these issues for for millennials require that kind of uh, honest conversation and honest talk. And, uh, uh, you know, we can't always look to the past either because uh, it's a different era, different time, different challenges. Yeah. I think um, if you listen to our last uh, Got Therapy uh, episode, Dan is talking a lot about that very issue that you 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 develop. Uh, developmental path that you and, and I'm paraphrasing but the idea is that uh, you're continually growing you have a different mind now than you had before um, he's he used the example he has a 12 year old son well he's never been a, a father of a 12 year old son until right. now and he has right. to adjust his brain to to that and the way he uh, works with his son and communicates with him in such a way because He's never been there before, but you can't go back. And I think his quote had something to do with uh, going uh, the good old days and going back to the past. That that does, Freud actually said there's just no uh, recoverable certainties. And I know I'm butchering that, but the idea is that um, you can't go home anymore because you're constantly moving and developing. I think another piece of this issue that you, you made me think about with this is that um, the complexity of it, our problems are becoming um, uh, 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 so, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out the right word, but they're, they're small in comparison to some of the larger issues that our thoughts about these issues, and this is also what we talked about as well, the thoughts about these issues that we have, let's take, for example, um, recycling and you recycle at home and you try to do these yeah. things but is it that thought that you have is it really helping and impacting the the larger problem that we have well why well we're doing our little <laughs> right. bit here but it aren't corporations responsible for more of that than the individual here at your house recycling things 
that our thoughts sometimes are not doesn't match up with the bigger uh, I- ways to solve the issue. So it may come come to what you mentioned a minute ago is learning how to work together, work as teams, uh, looking at all the various resources that we have. The complexity of that gets us off the bigger topic sometimes, and then we're worried about uh, some app on the phone or we're worried about something uh, minuscule in the bigger picture of things, and we're scattered in such a way that we don't have the cohesiveness of that group at NASA that said, okay, what do we have to fix this problem, put everything on the table, and I said, no, we're all siloed away into our little uh, minute problems that we're working on, and it doesn't address the bigger issue. Well, I'm clear, hoping that made sense. I'll just kind of it, no, it really, it, it really does. You, you made me think of several of the hot button issues now. One is uh, climate change. One is uh, uh, if for the U.S. immigration and immigration policy and that kind of thing. And uh, just to take climate change, w- you have two schools of thought. One is to uh, in the U.S., go all in on uh, a really what amounts to an economic uh, uh, trip to the moon, totally transform how we do things economically. And then you have the other side, of course, where you can't do that, you're giving away the store. At the same time, a large, I guess, challenge for climate change is that the develop countries that are developing economies are are really uh, uh, contributing way more to the uh, carbon issue than than the United States is, which where actually the carbon emissions have dropped. So right. so that's a level of complexity. Now we're a, we're a global economy, so that discussion can't be held unilaterally just in the United States. No more than uh, you have. Uh, an, or at least a couple of months ago, had an overwhelming surge of immigration uh, at our southern border and uh, that, that we were unable to contend with. Well, again, unilaterally for the United States to make a decision and try to resolve that issue refuses to recognize that it's a complex issue that goes all the way to uh, to what's happening in South America. Yeah, and right. you know one of the one of the first answers was well Mexico needs to do better. Well, right. You, you have you, you have Mexico who's where that government's contending with the same issues we are and the discussion needs to be broader and it needs to be more creative. And more in depth too, and because I, depth. I think sometimes it's like um, we talked around here about the soundbite, you know, and right. uh, uh, you get this, you receive the soundbite, and then that tells you everything you need to know. Uh, no, actually, it doesn't. It's just the soundbite in that moment, in that particular uh, instant. Whereas um, you, you just, I think we're almost stuck in this surface level of understanding sometimes, and. Uh, and back to our original idea we talked about with education, you, you have to become the critical thinker and really think about these things in depth, look at the broad range of things, look at it more in depth, drill down, to see what the research really says, find out what is correct about it so that you can have a, a, a good opinion about it and make good choices for yourself. So it's... Um, yeah, the 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 sound that reminded me of the soundbite idea. Just a couple of phrases that yeah. somebody said, meaning so much more. We we tend to to add on and yeah. we'll fill any void. This is a human be- trait, I guess, um, w- with um, whatever we were thinking and our belief systems already intact. And so, if it fits, right. uh, Dan and I talked about confirmation bias uh, on, over the weekend, and that, right. that that notion that we only want to believe what fits with what we already believe and so the idea of taking in new information and weighing things in a different way is difficult for people uh, absolutely but it's it's worth it to examine our own thoughts and beliefs about things and question some things along the way if you just take it at the surface level and say well that's all the information i need you're going to miss out on a lot i think it gets back to uh, Pinker and, and his writings as well. Yeah, well, it's a resilient strategy. 
because things are going to change. And here's the other thing, too, and, the, and you would know more about this than I would, the, the whole idea that we, we, tend to, we tend to leap to ideas. We tend to leap to opinions. Right. And then once we've particularly, let, excuse me, particularly from people that we value or we already have some belief in and hold to be credible, or or the opinions that are consistent with a, an uh, ideology we already have, right? Absolutely. But once stated, that opinion becomes a matter of ownership, right? I think I know where you're going with and this. And so, yeah. so then there's that calcification where uh, you're unable to consider another opinion because ultimately that'll threaten you as an individual because, like, you're a, if you're a fan of uh, one university's football team, well, you're a diehard fan. I mean, right. you're just a fan, and that's the best football team. And even when it's bad, uh, it's time to fire the coach. It, it, it right, right. There's, it's, it's. And by a, the way, I don't know. Just to take take a, a, a off on a branch here, but have you if you've talked to someone who is a diehard fan, and we have one in our family who's a Falcon fan, okay. Atlanta Falcons. Boy, it was a and rough said, weekend for I, us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. And so uh, when you talk about him, what about the other? T- he has. No interest whatsoever in any other teams or uh, other sports, by the way, too. So, yeah, there's an entrenchment that happens there. Yeah. So I, I think one of the strategies has to be ultimately for uh, for folks who are trying to resolve issues to listen to each other and to look at all the facts. Yeah. And then, uh, remember, we, we discussed that whole idea of uh, reframing uh, the facts, reorganizing the facts, right. what, yeah. it looked at one way. Hey, and, you know, you mentioned the Atlanta <laughs> Falcons game. I watched part of that game until it just was too horrible. Too, to, hard, <laughs> too but, hard to watch. But here's the thing. There were two takeaways. One, as a fan, you could be frustrated and say, how could all this money be spent and all this effort be, be put into this and the team to really not perform very well? And, but there's a whole other way to look at it that maybe they're trying new things and it's just the cake's not ready yet. So, I mean, there, there's all kinds of ways you can reframe. And I think to, to ultimately to really resolve issues, you got to do that. So, Well, I, uh, I've enjoyed this conversation, first of all. Uh, we, I think we picked, picked apart the millennial problems, uh, <laughs> at least according to uh, – our, our sources here, um, and we touched on some of the issues. It's, it's tough for millennials. And, um, you know, we're, we're finding out that we, we're learning about how we deal with problems as well, and maybe the comparison from, from Pinker about how well we're doing, and uh, maybe we should be grateful for that and take a look at what, how we can solve these problems and put our, our heads together in a way to uh, help solve some of these bigger problems and – be open to new information. That seemed to be a theme today. And and I don't know if I did very well on the whole millennial issue. I mean, I, I, I may have gone uh, with the whole back in the day concept. It was just as tough back in the day. Uh, but but in in thinking about it, you can't really compare uh, the the whole economic landscape and the cultural landscape of the late sixties, early seventies, which was when I was right coming into that age, right, you can't really compare that with what's happening this millennium. No, I mean, we've you never really been can't. here before. That's right. That's, we've never that, been here before. That's it. And uh, wow, some things from our past can really help us navigate this difficult, uh, these difficult situations. But other things, um, maybe not so. We can't rely on that past. I think you just said that. And the idea that, uh, okay, being open to learning, being, uh, you know, taking in new information and weighing that information, and let's move toward a good decision here as we move along. The whole idea of beginner's mind, right? Right. I so. think so. we got to talk about that some more. Well, yeah. here we are. I'm just pulling this up on the, on the screen. This is the episode we deal. This is our first episode, and yep. uh, the only... Uh, so-called expert that you could find 
uh, uh, happen to be me in that. So uh, maybe we can wait till we really get an expert in here um, as well. Just want to invite people to take a look at our, uh, our YouTube uh, channel at Columbus Television. We put all of our videos, of course, Got Therapy, all those things um, online for you to kind of peruse through. We've been doing it for a while. Uh, so uh, want to invite people invite people in to uh, take a look at some of the things that, that we're doing around here and welcome anyone who wants to join us as well. Tom, this has been great. Thank you so much for this uh, conversation. Today. Always good to be down at Columbus Media Group here in First Avenue, Columbus, uptown. And uh, uh, always a pleasure. All right, I'll see you next